Thank you, worship team. Thank you, media team. Uh, I was confused as to whether or not I was going to be introduced because I'm not sure if I'm a guest speaker or, or what exactly. Uh, to catch you up, uh, so I was a pastor on staff here for seven years. And then last year, God called me to a, a new ministry with Rise Up Kings, which is a, a men's uh, personal development, Christian personal development uh, organization. And my friend Jason is here. Uh, he's, vis he's in from Arizona. He's coming to volunteer at one of our events this week. And so he came in early, so I invited him to come. So glad you're here, Jason. Um, and um, yeah, Pastor Lane, I, I, I did not give him a hard time at all about bailing on, on my time here because um, he, he was super apologetic. Um, I don't think he had a lot of choice about um, preaching in Abilene today. I think that was more of a, he was informed than, than requested. Uh, and as a, a good soldier, he, he did what he was told. So uh, it was great to see a few of you at the India Gospel Mission uh, fundraising banquet a couple of weeks ago. Um, got to see some of you there. Um, so, uh, sorry, goodness couldn't be with us today. She uh, had a long, hard week and, and was, was tired and wasn't feeling great. Um, but just so to catch you up, we are settling into our new church, uh, in, uh, church in Plano, because as you know, I live like 50 miles from here, which is a long way through the part of the Metroplex that it goes through. And, um, and so we're settling into our church there in Plano, found a, a small group that meets near us, uh, and we're, we're, we're doing okay. So uh, we miss you guys. It's great to see you. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, if, if this goes okay, maybe I'll get to come back. So if it goes badly, just we'll kill the recording and you tell Pastor Lane that it went well. Is that a, is that a deal? Okay, cool. All right. Um, let's, let's pray before we dive in. Father in heaven, I pray that as you have guided the meditations of my heart this week, so also would you guide the words of my mouth this morning for your glory. And that by a miracle of your spirit, you would take every word and transform it in every ear into the message that you have for every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do you picture God? Like specifically God the Father. When, when you imagine God, what, what image comes to mind? What, what does he look like? I asked a group this last week that I was teaching, and they started giving me answers about God's character, about how God interacts with us. And, and I, I tried to be patient, and I listened, and I said, okay, you've described God, but, but what does God look like? Like, how do you picture him? So, I can't get fired, so let's have some audience participation. Uh, what, what, somebody give me a, an image, like a physical image of what you imagine God to look like. Cloudy? <laughs> Gandalf, okay. Gandalf, I'm sure, is pretty close. Um, but cloudy. Say again? Just pure light. Pure light, okay. What else? Somebody else? Revelation Jesus. Revelation, revel, Revelation Jesus? The white horse and the eyes of fire. Okay, the white horse and the sword and, and all the, okay, like, like warrior Jesus. Okay, cool. Cool. So that, okay, Isaiah? I'm going to say I can't describe him because in John it says no one has seen me. The right, naturally, right? We, we, we know that, but we still gotta, we still gotta imagine something, right? Okay, cool, but the, good point. Okay, Isaiah wins the, he, you check mark, okay, Bible answer. All right. All right, one more. So he looks just like you. Okay. Was that, was that Matt who said in his image? Yeah. Okay, so God looks like Matt is, is what I'm getting at. Stacy. Bigger than you. Isn't that most people? I, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Okay. All right. I, before I get in any more trouble. Okay. Bigger than all of us. Okay. Fair. So when I was a kid, my parents would tell me how, how God is number one in heaven, number two that he sees everything, and number three that he's in control everything. So to my five-year-old brain, that seemed like a lot of work. And so um, that it would take a lot of concentration and organization. So I'm pretty sure my, my first vision of God was this kind of grandfatherly, a lot like Gandalf, yeah, this grandfatherly image um, wearing all white, and he was definitely sitting at a desktop computer. 
be, because he was, he was having to organize and orchestrate everything happening in the universe in like this really serious look of concentration on his face. Um, and I didn't know what a spreadsheet was at that age, but if I had, God definitely would have used a spreadsheet to manage the universe. So anyway, that was my view of God until a few years later, I watched the movie, The Ten Commandments. Okay, 1959, Charlton Heston, I mean, Moses meets God at the burning bush in, the, in his, uh, we wet that up there, it's, it's, it's a little hard to see, but you see Moses there at the burning bush in his, his Midianite exile period, and like, and there's this, Moses, take off your shoes, for you are on holy ground, and like, like, eight-year-old me was like, whoa, that's really intense, right? So, Anyway, the church I grew up in, we couldn't, watch any, we couldn't watch anything fun on the Sabbath, so I watched the movie The Ten Commandments approximately 9,000 times. So it was all I, could, I was allowed to watch. So, um, so speaking of movies, how has Hollywood depicted God? Okay, in 1977, there was this movie called Oh God, where God was portrayed by a cigar-smoking George Burns. Okay, and I have, I've not seen any of these movies except The Ten Commandments, so I cannot be held accountable for what's in the movies. Um, I just know that I wasn't allowed to watch this movie because it depicted God, number one, and worse, God was smoking a cigar. So, to this day, I've not seen this movie or any of its sequels. And if you have, you can tell me about it after church. Okay, so, um, so that's the 70s and 80s because that, those movies were 70s and 80s. So I guess needing a big promotion from playing Moses, Charlton Heston portrays God in the movie Almost an Angel in 1990. Okay, so a little more Gandalfy. Okay, that, that helps. Okay, and, and then it, later in the 90s, uh, I thought about talking about Alanis Morissette playing God in the 1999 film Dogma, but I'm pretty sure that putting up a picture of Alanis Morissette on the screen during church would either rip a hole in the space-time continuum or at least ensure that I don't get invited back. So we're not going to put Alanis Morissette on the screen. If you know, you know. Okay, so things start to improve, and uh, I guess w when we get to Morgan Freeman in Bruce Almighty, 2003, right? That's, that's an upgrade, okay? We, we, at least, like, you thought the voice was good in, in the Ten Commandments, like, now you got Morgan Freeman's voice, right? And finally, one more, we have Octavia Butler in The Shack in 2017, right? So, so there's certainly something a little troubling about each of these depictions of God in film, right? Like, it just makes you a little bit uneasy, okay, that you have, uh, you have an actor portraying God. It feels like, I don't know, disrespectful to create dialogue for God that isn't from Scripture. But still it calls the question, how do you see God? How do you experience God? Do you have any concepts of God that are off base or, or might be off base? So God, by definition, is not knowable in his totality. We can't know everything there is to know about God. In fact, we're lucky that we know anything about God because the nature of God's unknowability and our limited perception means that we wouldn't know anything about God if God didn't tell us about himself. So I'm going to do this quote from uh, theologian John Stonecipher. He says, John says, you can't know me unless I choose to reveal myself to you. Without my choice to self-reveal, the best you can do is gather information about me. It's like that with God. Knowing God doesn't happen when you think about the thing in your mind that you call God. Knowing God happens when God acts to make himself known. Well, John is not only a great theologian, he was also my roommate in college. And... Um, he was a year ahead of me in school. He had about 30 IQ points on me, and he was always way ahead of me spiritually. And he posted that quote that I just read on Facebook this week, uh, because that's the kind of deep stuff that he thinks about all the time. And when we were in college, I asked him, because he, he was such a deep thinker, uh, and I said, why aren't you majoring in theology? And here was his response. Eh, isn't theology the, the study of God by definition? That sounds like what a biographer would do study all the facts about someone. I don't know, I don't want to know about God like a biographer. I want to know God like a friend knows a friend. So now that you know that this dude was that deep at 21 years old, let me tell you his 49-year-old quote again. You can't know me unless I choose to reveal myself to you. 
Without my choice to self-reveal, the best you can do is gather information about me. It's like that with God. Knowing God doesn't happen when you think about the thing in your mind that you call God. Knowing God happens when God acts to make himself known. So, we're going to do audience participation again because last time went really well. Way better than I expected, actually. How has God acted himself to, to make himself known to human beings? There's like six right answers, and if you give a wrong answer, I'll try to turn it into a right one. <laughs> How has God revealed himself to us? Through his word. Through his word. And by that you mean? Bible. The Bible. Okay, fantastic. Great answer. What else? Prayer. Through prayer. Okay, through our personal experience of him. Isaiah. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. I like this. He gives his answers in Bible verses. Yeah, Jesus, the fullest revelation of God. Great. Stacey. For me, it was divine revelation. Okay, divine revelation how? Okay, so it was a, a personal, like God revealed himself to you directly. Okay. Through the Spirit. Yeah, that, that's on here too. One, one more, or two more I'm thinking of. Or actually, three more. Sharon. Through nature, yeah. That was the first one I had. Uh, Romans 1, 20. God's invisible qualities, his divine nature are self-evident in creation. Matt. In the, in the garden, in the garden, in the beginning, in the cool of the garden, he, in the cool of the day, he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Yes, the fancy word for that is theophany. Theo, God, fanny, that uh, revelation, where God just comes and like shows up, reveals himself. Okay, one more. Fire, wind, and a still small voice. Fire, wind, and a still small voice, which would fit into the category of theophany. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, one more. Fellowship with others. Fantastic. You got the last one. The spirit. So fellowship by the spirit, like, like Stacy talked about, and through the church throughout history. Okay. All of it. So this is what I wrote down. Natural revelation, theophany as recorded in scripture, scripture itself, Jesus, the spirit and the church throughout history, and our personal experience. Okay. So, man, we should do this more often. Okay. I feel like David Crowder. We should sing together more often. Okay. So what, what other influences... What else influences how we perceive God for good or bad for, from our own experience? This is the last part of audience participation. Stacy. I think that um, like, if we're going through a really difficult time, we'll say some negative things are going on in our life, the enemy can use parts of the Bible to make it seem like God is coming out in a negative way. Hmm. So our negative experiences, our, our difficult times can create a lens for us that make God seem not as loving, not as kind, not as protecting. Okay, Nick. Yeah, yeah, bad, bad advertising, right? Okay, people who, who, who claim to be Christians but, but don't, uh, don't, aren't good advertisements for God. Okay, a couple more. Someone I haven't heard from yet. All the introverts are like, is he looking at me? <laughs> yeah, I need two introverts who haven't talked yet to tell me something else that may have happened, that to, not to you, but could happen to someone that might negatively affect how they perceive God. And then I'll get to talking. The brokenness of the world, like, like war and suffering and pain, right? We, we see all this and we go, wait a second, if, how, if all this is happening, like wh where is God? Wh wh what is God doing here? So the problem of evil is the, the fancy way of saying that. Okay, one more. Say again. Death. So experiencing the uh, other people that we love when they die. So the, the difficulty of that loss. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Those are great. A couple more. Our family of origin, especially our parents. Okay, how we, how we interact with our parents helps, shapes how we see God, right? Our early church experiences, the things we hear in church, right? Our experience of Christian community, for good or bad, like Nick said, okay? Um, our life experiences, like Stacey said, they create a theological lens. And then our false assumptions, just assumptions that we make because we don't have anything going to, to tell us otherwise. Okay, so now that we have fully dived in to this issue of how we perceive God. 
I want to I want to unpack a handful of different ways we misperceive God, right? And and what that what that's like, and then how we can we can apply the truth of God as as He's revealed to confront it. Okay, so the only way this is going to work is if you can say you can take your own perception of God and and take it out and look at it and say I perceive God a certain way. And it has to be incomplete. It has to be imperfect because God is unknowable, right? And so that, that humility about my own perception about God is what's going to allow you to, say, to, to look at it from a bunch of different angles and say, maybe there's something I need to add or take away from how I perceive God to understand him more fully. Okay, are you willing to do that? Okay, great. All right. The first one and I hear this from a lot of people, is this idea that God is kind of on his back back of his heels, unforgiving, waiting for us to clean up our act before he forgives us. Or, Or waiting for us to be worthy of forgiveness. You know how many times I hear people say, I don't feel worthy of forgiveness? What would that even look like? The whole point of needing forgiveness is that you messed up right? And, and that you need forgiveness because you're not worthy of being forgiven. You, if, if I need to forgive Becca, it's because Becca's hurt me in some way. There's no way she becomes worthy. Well, if she, if she just makes it, does enough nice things to, for us to get even, then there's no forgiveness. She just made up for it, right? The, the whole po- so the idea of worthy of forgiveness doesn't make, doesn't make any sense to me. So we, we, we have this idea of, of God waiting for us to clean up our act, both before we accept forgiveness in initial faith, that was my experience. I, I wanted to be a Christian. I was like, I just don't know because like I've done all this bad stuff. And like I've done bad stuff that I knew was bad when I did it. And I was like, I know this is bad. I know God's going to be mad at me, but I want to do it anyway because it's fun. And by the way, if you sin and it's not fun, it's because you're doing it wrong. Okay. That's a Craig Groeschel quote. If that bothers you, blame him, not me. Okay. So, um, so like, so I was like, I just, he can't forgive me because I didn't, I didn't just make a mistake. I willfully did what I knew was wrong, which is, you know what that's called? That's called sin. Okay. Like, like that, that's, that's the nature of it. Okay. And then even after we become Christians, we're like, yeah, but I messed up again. And, and I know he's, I know he's mad at me and I, I got to like make up for it. And I got to like be good. And I did that bad thing. So I got to make sure I go to church a lot and like read my Bible a lot. And, and then I'll, then I'll be like, fill out this like short term, most recent Christian resume. And then I can go to God and be like, now will you forgive me? Who does that? Am I the only one? Okay. Only my friend Jason, who's honest. Okay. No, a few of you. Okay. This, this sense, of like, like I got I to gotta be good again before he'll accept me. So the, 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 we have this view that there's this line of acceptability. This is, this is very acceptable. This is minimum acceptability. And we're constantly like trying to, trying to get up to, oh, I made it, I made it. Oh, I messed up again. Oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Oh, I made it, yay, yay, yay. Oh, I messed up again. And, and, and we live our lives constantly below this, this very difficult line to achieve. That, that, that's, that's how we see God. And so the fundamental question in this misperception of God is, can God really accept me? Can God really accept me? Another version of this is, my sin is unforgivable because it's too bad, or because I did it intentionally, or because I defied God. And, and I've shared this with, with many of you. Like, my freshman year of college, I was sitting in a lecture hall in this required Bible class that everybody was forced to take. And I was, that's where I was, this, but my sin is too bad. God can't forgive me. And the professor said, and I don't even like that professor. Like if I saw him today, I wouldn't even talk to him. But God used him anyway. <laughs> that was funnier than I expected it to be. Okay. But this, this professor, he said, there is no sin so great that it cannot be covered by one drop of Jesus' blood. And that was the moment I, I accepted the forgiveness offered in the cross of Jesus. And it's just as true for you today as it was for me 30 years ago that, that God's forgiveness is, is plenty. It's, that there's no sin outside the redemptive power of Jesus' work on the cross. So I, I want to read you something um, and 
hopefully this will not make you stop listening, like, oh, he's going to read something, but, but will make you pay a little more attention because it's from the Bible. Okay, so I'm going to pull Isaiah's trick. Okay, so this is from Luke 18, okay? And, and before I start, let me, let me explain something. So imagine a foreign country comes and, like, invades America and takes over, and we all become, like, like slave class, okay, because they're in charge, right? And they're extracting these horrific taxes from us. And some Americans like become tax collectors to help the occupying force and they charge you more than they have to to line their own pockets. How would you feel about them? Yeah, that's what a tax collector was in Jesus's day. They were Jews who worked for the Romans, okay? They're the worst of the worst. Nobody wants to talk to them. All right, you got the context. And remember that fair, I feel so like, like studious and professory when I take my glasses on. I got to do that more. Okay, so, and then remember that Pharisees, Pharisees are like the super, super righteous, right? They're like the, I don't know, missionaries. I would say pastors, but nah, missionaries maybe, okay? So, now you understand the context. Let's read, all right. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. He said this, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector over here, a sinner like everyone else. I don't cheat. I don't sin. I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. Wow, must be nice. But the tax collector stood at a distance because he couldn't feel like worthy of approaching God. Stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. Much shorter prayer. Jesus says, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That word justified is the, is the passive voice of getting righteous, where God makes you righteous. Not, not because you muster up enough self-control to be righteous. He makes you righteous. He's the actor and you are the object. He's the subject, you're the object. He goes away justified. Why? Because he was penitent. He was contrite. He was repentant. He was sorry. I was told not to use big words, so I used a lot of synonyms. Okay. So, oh, I didn't, I didn't have to put my glasses on. I got the text right here. Okay. Okay. So that's number one. <laughs> I feel like I'm being a little too honest here. Okay, number two. We have this idea that it's kind of related to the first one, that God's this stern teacher, right? Still with like, uh, like heels, like, like uh, weight on his heels, like tapping a ruler, like waiting for us to mess up. Like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Ah, gotcha, right? So my, this image that I have of God is my third grade teacher, Mrs. Parr. And um, she never actually broke a ruler on me, but there were rumors that she had broken rulers, like, like slapping kids on the, on the wrist and like yardsticks on their back. It probably wasn't true, but we all believed it because she was meaner than snot. Okay, so, and the, the idea is that God, and, and, and Jason's going to recognize this from a book we read, the, the idea that God is on this uh, like, like swivel chair, right? He's like, oh, you're doing good, you're doing good. Oh, you messed up. Hmm, well, we'll just see about that. And he turns his back on us when we mess up. You ever feel that way? Like, like I do. Like, when I mess up, I'm like, oh, like, I can't even go, I can't even go be close to him because he's probably turned away. Like, um, like when, I, I remember, um, and by the way, my mom is wonderful, wonderful human being. She used to tell me when I would get in trouble, she'd say, shame on you for five minutes. <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, okay. I'd just go and like, sit in the corner and like wait for the five minutes to be up. And then she would just release me from it, which was, which was fine. But like, I, I just feel like God's saying like, shame on you for five days, right? Because you messed up. I'm like, okay. I just sit in the corner, like, right? But, but that's, that's, not how it, that's not how it works. We know that, right? Okay, so I usually preach from the New Living Translation because it's super understandable and I love it because it, it brings it down for me. But th there's this, this verse that I, I want to read to you from the King James. Like that's like literally 400 years old. But, but th there's this one way it says something that really grabs our attention. It says, John 6, 37, Jesus says, 
all whom the Father give me, giveth me, let me, let me do it right, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Everybody say no wise. No wise. No wise. Okay, that is a translation, and, and here's, here's the Greek. Okay, u me. Guess what u means? It means not. And me means not. Okay, so it's a, a way of, of making it negative. Okay, but you know how when, when, when we want to really emphasize something, we say, we say, um, how, give, me, give me an example of a double negative to emphasize something. Definitely. Say again. Do, you, bet, you better don't not do that. Definitely. Definitely. No, that's, a, that's a, just an emphasis. So we, we, do, the, we do this em, like, like no way, no how. Okay? No way, no how. Okay? That, so when, that's, that no wise is a translation of this double negative, which by the way is grammatically correct in the Greek, and it's a way of really emphasizing definitely not. Definitely not. Ume, okay? So, I want to read you this. This is from a, a book by uh, John Bunyan, uh, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which is the second best-selling book of all time after the Bible. And, and he, he spent a lot of time diving into this verse, okay? When Jesus says, I will in no wise cast you out. Notice that he says, all the Father give me. So God the Father is the actor, right? He, we, we respond in faith because God gives us that ability, right? Provenient grace to, to respond to God. Okay, and then um, that he gives us to Jesus and Jesus says, all who, what, come to me. That's the requirement. That's the requirement that we come to Jesus. Okay, so this is from John Bunyan. But I am a great sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast you out, says Christ. But I am an old sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast you out, says Christ. I'm going to keep reading this until you believe it, okay? But I am a hard-hearted sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast you out, says Christ. But I'm a backsliding sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast you out, says Christ. But I have served Satan all my days, say you. I will in no wise cast you out says Christ. But I have sinned against the light, say you. I will in no wise cast you out, says Christ. But I have sinned against mercy, intentionally, say you. I will in no wise cast you out. But I have no good thing to bring with me, say you. I will in no wise cast you out. Let me read you another story to emphasize what I'm talking about. You know the story. It's called the story of the lost son and the prodigal father. The son who asks his father for his inheritance early, which is like saying, I don't care if you're dead. He runs off to the far country, spends all his money, ends up feeding the pigs. He says, look, I think, I think my, the servants in my father's house have it better than this. So he returned home to his father, Luke 15, verse 20, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you, both you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. You know the song Amazing Grace written by the reformed slave trader John Newton? That's where he got that line from Luke 15. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What makes more sense in this story would be a father who's ready with a lecture. That's the kind of father I am. A lecture for his prodigal son. But the truth about God is that he loves us all in spite of our actions. And we're like the prodigal son. Actions that, that hurt ourselves and others. And he loves us in spite of our selfishness, our judgmentalism, our unforgiveness, like the brother who stayed home. But that's, that's not the, the way it works. The truth of, that's revealed about God the Father is that he doesn't violate our free will, but he longs for us to come home. And he, when we do, he welcomes us back. And he blesses us with his grace. That's the truth. Here's another one. 
How about this one? When bad stuff happens, it's God punishing us. There's a, a book that has transformed my life called uh, The Good and Beautiful God. And he, the author tells a story of when his daughter, he, when his wife was pregnant and the, the doctor told them that their baby had congenital birth defects and she wouldn't live past two years old. And they, they prayed and prayed and prayed and, tr and, and waited and waited and, and the baby was born and it was just as the doctors had said. And um, there was no way she was going to live past two years old. And the author, one, one of his friends, uh, took him to lunch and said, okay, Jim, who sinned, you or your wife? Jim said, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, well, this, this happened to your daughter. I mean, it must be God's response to either your sin or your wife's sin. And Jim was like, like he starts going through his path, like, okay, what, what have I done? Like, okay, I stole gum when I was six. It got worse in high school. Like, but, but I, I, don't, I can't think of anything that would be worthy of, of this happening to my daughter. But, but there's, we have this, this idea that when, some, when we see God this way and then something goes wrong, there's a part of us that says, did I cause this when we misperceive God? Jesus addressed this very issue. John 9 as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Do you see how it's the same question that the friend asked Jim? Jesus rejects it as the false dichotomy that it is. And he says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So the power of God could be seen. He, 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 he squashes this idea that when bad stuff happens, it's God punishing us. And he, and he squashes it once and for all and he heals the man and, and, and this, this magnificent display of, of, of the man born blind who's the only one who gets Jesus and all these other people who can see but they can't see Jesus, that they're the ones who are blind. We have to reject that idea that we caused it. Okay, another one. And we're moving, we're moving fast here. The idea that God is indifferent. That he's just leaving us on our own. Okay? This is, the, uh, this is clockmaker theology. You ever heard of this? Clockmaker, like, like God created the universe like a really fancy clock, and then he put it up on the shelf, and then he just leaves it alone. It, it's kind of operating on its own. It's self-sufficient, but he doesn't really get involved. Kind of a, a Christian version of this is that he, he made the clock, and then he's like, oh, let me step in and die on the cross and get resurrected and then go back to heaven and it continues just being a clock. Okay, that's like the most Christian version of this clockmaker idea. It's called deism. And by the way, and I'm not saying this just to butter up the English people in the room, okay? But this clockmaker thing, this is our American heritage. Because when you want to throw off a king... And, and this idea of the divine right of kings has been the way you've thought for thousands of years and you want to get rid of that king, it's real helpful to imagine a God who does not set rulers in place but makes a clock and puts it on a shelf so that then we can throw off that ruler and we can start our own country with our own declaration of independence. You tracking with me? So this is our American heritage, this, this clockmaker idea. And, and it leads to this American bootstrap theology. I, we're we're going to go out to the, to the frontier and we're going to make a life for ourselves. Brr. Right? Because it's all up to us. Which is fine. Until we realize that what that calls to question is, does God really care? Does God really care about what happens in my life? And, and since I'm on my own, will I really make it? Right? When, when, when I was a kid, my, my, my dad, he, he's just a negative guy. My, I said my mom was great. My, my dad's great too. But anyway, he, he would do this thing where he, he would be like, make up these hypotheticals where if this happens and then this happens, then we're going to lose the business and we're going to lose our house and we're going to be living under a bridge. This is like constant narrative in my house, right? And he was like serious. It wasn't like, he wasn't making a joke. And, and th th this idea that, that we're all on our own. And th because this, this clockmaker idea is so part and parcel to our American way of thinking, I had to like go into great depths to explain it to my wife. Because for, for her, from West Africa, God is involved in everything. The idea that God is indifferent is like the, like the weirdest concept to her. So I had to explain the, the whole clockmaker thing. And I was like, so, so babe, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what, what's the truth in Scripture that, that makes us 
that makes us know that that's not true. And, and like, you know me, like, I'm always trying to make y'all think I know a lot about the Bible. Look how smart I am. Look, 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 look. And she's just like, quiet, and how are you? Right? But this is how she thinks. This stuff just started rolling off her tongue. She said, well, in, in the Psalm, she, she quoted this one, Psalm 46, one, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Isaiah 40, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Isaiah 41, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up by my victorious right hand. And she quoted this one too, 1 Peter 5, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. And finally, Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. A God who makes a universe like a clock and puts it on a shelf does not have specific plans for you and me, but our God does. Because he's involved in the intricate details. Hebrews 4, the high, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays with us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The Holy Spirit knows your emotions more deeply than you do. When you can't put what you're feeling into words, he can. That's how intimately he knows you. This is not a God who makes a clock and put it on a shelf. The truth is, the Spirit guides us, teaches us, speaks to our hearts when we ask him. And God is very interested in even the smallest details of our lives. A few years ago, I was at my, my best friend's church in Arkansas, and this, this lady, she was uh, maybe in her, in her early 70s, and she had this, it, it, we'd had a potluck after church, and she had this empty pie plate, and she was beaming. She was ecstatic. And she was like, I was in the grocery store, and I didn't know whether to get a blueberry pie or a peach pie, and I prayed to God, and he told me which pie to get, and, and look, everybody loved it. And my first thought was, are you on drugs? Why do you think that God would care about which pie to get? And you know why God cared about which pie to get? Because she cared about it. There's no detail too small in our life that, that God is indifferent about. If you want to invite him into it, he cares. One more, and then I'm in my seat. Sometimes we perceive that God is our cosmic waiter, like a Santa Claus. He's there to give us everything we want. And this is maybe the hardest one for us to confront in our tradition. Because when we hold this view, we see financial abundance as God's favor. And what's the problem with that? The problem is that if we believe that, then we see those in poverty and go, oh, they must not have God's favor. We say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And what do we mean? I got enough in, I got enough in the account to cover my needs. But maybe that homeless person is blessed too. Maybe... For him or her, God is enough. And the other problem with this is that we see illness and injury as God failing us. When, when things go wrong, at best we think God is mad at us, and at worst we think that God isn't worth worshiping. That he isn't worth sticking with because he didn't fulfill his end of the bargain, which is what? To make us happy, healthy, and wealthy. Isn't that what God's for? If he's our Santa Claus. The fact is this shallow view thinks that God's purpose is just that. To make us happy, healthy, and wealthy. And the reality is that God wants us to be holy and emotionally healthy and whole. And by that I mean mature and complete. And he wants us to be wise, to flourish in the abundant life. When we have that view, we, we, we see trials as something that God needs to fix and take care of to get me back to my flourishing, my happy, healthy, and wealthy. But it denies the truth of James 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You know what that means? It means that the suffering he allows is not to destroy us. It's to transform us. The, su the suffering that we go through is like the weight on the weight bench that's there to make us stronger because it's difficult. The fact is he's more interested in your courage and your grit and your power than he's interested in your comfort. 
Romans 5 says that, that our, our sufferings lead to character and our character leads to hope. If, if, we, if we didn't have any difficulties, we couldn't develop that kind of hope. You see, here in America, we like to pray away our problems. God, take away this problem. My, my job stinks. God, would you give me a new job? Hey, friends, would you help me get, would you pray for me to get a new job? We, we always pray that God would take away our problems. But in other parts of the world, I don't see it like that all the time. Instead, they asked, God, would you give me strength and wisdom to endure? Would you teach me everything you have to teach me in this difficulty? Because we know that a, the God who loves us wants us to be transformed. He wants us to grow and flourish. So here's what I came to say today. God is ever in pursuit of you. Your heart, your trust, your love, because he longs to see you and know you and love you. And to be seen, known, and loved by you. I want you to know that at forgiveness flows from the heart of God. Jesus is not standing at the big desk of an angry father negotiating for our forgiveness. The redemptive work on the cross was the lofty goal of the Trinity from no later than the moment of the fall in the garden. It was God's design from maybe before then, but definitely not after then. And forgiving you for God is like a missionary doctor who goes to a remote village in the Amazon where people are sick and he's got all this medicine. And he's, I I'm here to help. And they go, oh no, we don't know what you're doing here. Like everything I have, th this is what I'm here for. And finally, a handful of people walk up with the courage to accept that medicine. How do you think the doctor feels? Finally, this is what I'm here for. That's God's attitude toward forgiving you every time we turn to him in repentance. And finally, struggle in life, difficulty, hardship, and pain are part and parcel of life. Jesus did not come to give us an easy, rich, problem-free life. He came to give us an abundant life with positive relationships, with community and acceptance, with positive emotions, with peace and joy and hope, meaning and engagement and accomplishment in our work and in his mission. He came that you might know him and not just know about him. That you might experience his forgiveness and the freedom that comes from knowing the God who loves you will never forsake you. In no way, no wise, will he cast you out. Maybe, hopefully, something today has caught your attention. Some misperception you have about God and some truth has been spoken into it. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for revealing yourself to us. Would you send your spirit deep into the crevices of our hearts? Holy Spirit, would you come and speak truth to the lies that we've believed? Would you give us the courage to come clean to you about our sin? Would you give us the knowledge to see the heart of God and how his forgiveness flows from who he is. He doesn't struggle or strain. Would you remind us of this truth? Would you remind us that God is always working for our good? Even when it looks like he's forgotten us, even when it looks like this, this trial is going to destroy us, would you remind us that he works everything for the, those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose? God, we love you. Thank you for, Jesus, thank you for coming and dying on the cross that we might be restored and reconciled to you now and forever. It's in your name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.